and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Mandy McLeod. They say it's a world first, dreamed up here in New Zealand. We reveal a new private insurance policy designed to help farmers protect their livestock against natural disaster losses, like those killer spring storms down south that decimated lambs. But what's the catch? Is it too good to be true? Why now? Why here? Wool prices, the forecast to increase by 40%. With farmers feeling flush, can wool partners breathe new life into their co-op plans? And mining Northland, is it really the economic answer to their prayers? Joining me is Conrad Wilkshire, General Manager of Advice and Insurance with Farmers Mutual Group, and Don Nicholson, Chairman of Federated Farmers of New Zealand. Welcome. Conrad, Hello, now I understand that in response to the, the spring storms, where around about three quarters of a billion dollars worth of lambs yep. were lost uh, throughout Canterbury and the King Country, etc. And as a result, Farmers Mutual Group have developed a new insurance policy. Can you tell us about it? Yes, yeah, sure, Manny. Look, um, the scale of the disaster was actually both islands, North and South Island, Lower North Island particularly, and Southland um, s uh, certainly um, brought and captivated the country in terms of just that, that whole impact. So for us, it was a, um, you know, as a farmer-owned mutual and with a team on the ground that live and breathe these communities, we felt you know, there has to be a better way of dealing with these adverse events. Uh, if you look at business interruption, which is very topical at the moment, uh, with the earthquake clearly and, and natural disasters becoming more and more prevalent, it's, business interruption is a hell of a complex topic. It's about going through the balance sheets, looking at your historic income, and for many farmers, the whole issue is far too complex and too many red herrings for them to have confidence in it. So that wasn't going to work too well either. So we've actually looked to cut all the red tape and give agreed value benefits up front based on the valuation of their livestock at their balance day. Capital livestock. Capital, yeah. And this, um, this offer, in the first instance, and we remain open to all possibilities around supporting farmers, but in the first instance, it's been targeted at sheep farmers. So we thought we'd put a limited offer out in the market this year, get alongside the farmers, and see what they have to say about um, a, a pretty straightforward option that gives them agreed value benefits, and for a typical farmer, it might be the same cost as what they insure the farm ute. Or, or probably better put, a farm ute that hasn't been bent lately. So, okay. you know, that's, that's kind of where we're setting this up from. So it's a, it's a no-nonsense um, offer that allows them to take some cover to hedge uncertainty. And, you know, the farming industry, through, uh, has, like all businesses, has suffered a lot through this global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the commodity returns have you know, uh, favoured farming of late. But I mean, many farmers are pretty clear about next year. So, so Don, if I'm, if I'm getting this right, what, what, what Farmers Mutual Group are offering is um, capital stock insurance against a once in a generation event. They've got to be applauded, FMG, for seeing a gap in the market. It's been there for a long, long time over, you know, to manage risk. And they've developed a product and all power to their arm. They're first cab off the rank and farmers will either want it or, or not want it as, as Conrad's saying, but it is a product that they've developed especially to manage actually your profit at the end of the year. It's actually what we're looking to do is give an agreed cash benefit because just, and sorry Don, not to interrupt your score there, but the... <laughs> <laughs> we, These insurance blokes, yeah, I don't, eh? I don't, I don't, <laughs> but the, I think the key thing is about the complexity. Um, what we've decided is that farmers understand where, to, where the money needs to be spent. So if we can give them some cash flow in a tricky year where they've had to endure a, a natural disaster that's really, you know, emotionally it's quite hard to deal with, financially it can mm -hmm. be very tricky to deal with. So we're looking to give them cash and, and then if they want to use it to cover the cost of supplement, um, replacement of capital stock or lost revenue because the lambs aren't there, that's, that's how we're sort of setting it up. And that's great. So it yeah. sounds almost too good to be true. So yeah. Don, as a farmer... <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm a farmer too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't notice you were wearing boots. <laughs> Don, you know, as someone who's representing farmers, is, you know, why, why now? Why has this not been done before? Well, look, uh, you've seen television pictures that are pretty disturbing. Mm. Farmers do their best, but they can't manage uh, all risk away. You can put shelter in, you can do scanning, you can do colour mating, so you know you program uh, to a T, but um, Mother Nature sometimes just takes that, or plays that cruel hand, and uh, giving this option now for farmers who want to be secure to manage their risk uh, is is just something that's timely actually. Fantastic. Okay I'd like now to we'll move to wool prices. They're up 40%. Are farmers now going to use this 
as an excuse not to back an upcoming bid. Details yet unknown for Wool Partners to to re-emerge as a co-op. This Wool Partners Plan B. Yes, Plan B. Well, in my opinion, look, uh, Plan B will happen if farmers want it. It won't happen if farmers don't. Um, effectively, pl Plan A didn't work because farmers said no to the pr prospectus. They didn't get enough numbers to get across the line. There's plenty of people in the wool business in New Zealand now. So um, from my organisation's point of view, I'm not going to play with people's commercial ambitions. Um, what wins, wins. What fails, fails. Mm -hmm. I was at um, the recent International Farm Management uh, Conference down in Methven and there was a very strong focus on cooperatives. Yep. And cooperatives um, such as Fonterra and uh, New Zealand Merino really out in front driving prices. FMG is a co-op. Mutual. Mutual, Mutual. Yep, sorry. Owned by farmers. Owned by farmers. Yep, for farmers. Essentially, federated farmers is as well, I guess we could say. What is it going to take, however, f to get our meat industries up and running like the Fonterras and the meat in and the wool, wool industry? Look, uh, Mandy, we've had this debate for generations. Uh, centuries ago, we had debates about this, if you analyse it. Um, what wins and what loses again is up to sentiment. And uh, farmers are fickle, I agree, just like any other business. Whether a cooperative is, is the right structure for the meat and wool, a, a, a mega co-op, I'm meaning, is, yep. is still moot. Uh, same with wool, actually, where that is still moot. Um, one thing's for sure, uh, things have to get really rotten before you get people motivated to make change. And that's where we have been. 2007, the worst profitability in 50 years. That's why people came out with new reports. But there is lots of reports lying on, uh, on shelves, gathering dust, all saying the same thing, actually, in the wool industry. And that is that we need to, uh, farmers need to maintain ownership until at least the end of first stage processing, if not further up the value chain. Meat. Uh, not quite sure how that's going to play out, but just remember, there's a lot of history in the meat industry. Uh, when we joined, uh, when the Euro UK joined the EU, uh, that altered things for us, and we've taken some time to adjust. And we will adjust, but sadly, the flock is halved. What's it going to take to really energise our farmers? Because I mean, what you've said is things have to get really rotten. Well, we've seen them kind of get rotten. 2007. We're now 2011. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, I'd like to ask you this one. Yeah, look, I have a, a little bit of a different view, Don, on that. Is, and um, and I, I understand his perspective, and um, I've got plenty of neighbours close to me that would sort of share that sentiment too. And well, I think farmers are energised. Don't get them. Don't, yeah. I think your, your term is not right. Farmers are really energised. There's but generational change uh, happens as people right. get re-energised. Uh, look, I, I think you know, look, farming is still attracting talent into the industry, and I th and so that hasn't changed. And you know, you only got to look at the export receipts and what have you. It's, it's mm. vibrant, but. There has, um, fundamentally, it's not a level playing field. And certain sectors have not um, adapted as effectively as others. And so the dairy industry gets portrayed in one light, the sheep and beef industry, which is part of what my background is about, is, is portrayed in another light. But in reality, um, there are some pretty, there's some fundamental first principles that I think everybody's agreed on. It's just how to get there. So consolidating supply and gaining, to gain, um, some access to the value chain makes sense. Everybody mm -hmm. agrees mm -hmm. with it conceptually, but you know we've paid for a lot of consultant reports. The fact is, they're not. It's not a level playing field between the businesses. But just bear in mind, we've got super co-ops now, and there's uh, other entities starting up around them. Uh, so look, a super co-op is a super co-op for a while, and people change. Uh, nothing stays static. There's always a brighter idea somewhere, and evolution occurs. Yep. And we should never hold on to something if it's not right and uh, look, we'll evolve. It's a good time to take a break now. Coming up, swine disease, PMWS has cost our pork industry $50 million so far. Now a new disease has the potential to be even more devastating. Farmers refute claims they may poison Canada geese now that there's an easing in their protected status. And our hard-working dairy farmers who are Fonterra shareholders get set to receive a record payout for their white gold. A boom time's back down on the farm. Stay with us. Welcome back to Straight Talk. Swine disease, PMWS, has cost our pork industry $50 million so far. But there are now concerns that a new disease may be more threatening if not stopped at the border. What do we think? 
Any comments on that, Doc? Well, look, biosecurity is absolutely paramount for this country, and to think that we rely so much on exports out of our country, having the gold standards, we we tip bucket loads of money into making sure our produce going to other parts of the world is perfect, uh, but we don't tip mm. buckets. Well, we do tip buckets, but it's not absolutely uh, fixing the problem on imports coming to this country. So importers of product into this country need to pay a whole lot more. I mean, we can't export a biosecurity problem to ourselves. It's other exporters from other countries uh, sending it to us via their import uh, methods. And so in the end, they have to pay and in the end the consumers have to pay because if you want to protect New Zealand's island status, it's, it's great biosecurity ability. I mean this island status, South Pacific, clean, uh, away from everybody else is a great uh, national benefit. We need to so maintain So you completely it. agree with what, what Sam McIver, the CEO of Look, Pork Industry is saying, we need to tighten up our, our import well, regulations. With very good understanding we need to know what the problem is, make sure we put rigour around those problems and really develop a process. But the industry in New Zealand uh, is already paying a lot of money to make good export standards mm. work. Uh, we need to have good import standards work and that's that's Sam's uh, beef really is the, the government is trying to talk about this cost sharing. pork really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well talking about uh, cost sharing with industry and you know we're already paying a lot. Uh, it's time uh, importers to this country paid their share and they're not. Fantastic. Conrad, mining in Northland. There's, you know, there is reportedly pots of gold or other you know, valuable minerals under a lot of farms up in Northland. What do you think? Well, I don't think it's limited to Northland either because actually there was similar discussion about opportunities in the South Island as well. Yeah, sure. So, look, I mean, I don't have a firm view either way other than I don't think we should rule anything out and it's about how things are done. So I think if it's consulted properly and it's managed appropriately, it would be, it would seem to me foolish not to at least actually understand what the opportunity is before it's dismissed out of hand so, just on the first principle. So that uh, in itself says to me the whole uh, country needs to be educated better about uh, the pros and cons. And I can say, I can say quite clearly that without the harvest of the uh, land, the water, including the sea, and the view, we don't have an economy. There's plenty of people in this country think you can have an economy on thin air. Uh, you can't, we actually have to use the environment, you have to use it wisely, you have to yep. use the resources the planet gives up for you wisely and sustainably. And sustainability to me means being able to do something indefinitely. And, uh, yeah, but we've got this mindset in this country that you can't touch stuff. Um, there's no less water on the planet today than there was yesterday. It's just in a different place. There's a whole lot of things need talked about. So Conrad, you'd refute the comment that uh, was made in the straight furrow by farmer um, Eric Edwards, who suggested that intensive dairy farming was more polluting than mining. Um, yeah, I definitely would say that... Or a mischievous comment. I yeah, yeah, look, um, I'm, I've got um, everybody's entitled to review, uh, but I, I would certainly, my first-hand experience doesn't uh, back that up, you know, and it's as recent as the other weekend, I was out on a, a farmer meat country day that actually Don's team put together and you know it was a great example of um, you know a great Huanui farm there that was living and breathing a sort of a sustainable farming model with native plantings, um, quite intensive programs, uh, completely re-kitted the farm from say five years ago and there was the old redundant way of doing it there for everybody to see and the new way and mm. I'm, not, I'm not saying there still isn't a change program in play but to say that everybody is just um, sitting on their hands with it, it just isn't an accurate statement. And I'd have to say that we read this all the time in the media, there's a lot of moral pollution in the media. And oh, we need, I like we need that, to stop it. I like we need that, to moral stop pollution. It. You need to get away from the emotional um, arguments Absolutely. and get back to real stuff. And it's so easy for someone to make a statement like that and then make headlines. It just drives me nuts in my job. Great, great. So stretching on from that, because you're gonna love this one then. Wellington MP, Peter Dunn suggesting that the first thing that uh, farmers are going to do when the protected status, uh, protected species status listing for Canada geese is lifted is that we are all going to get out there and start poisoning these poor old geese. Well, poor old Peter, I say. Uh, that is not legal and it won't be done. Uh, sorry, are we... pun. I like that. I like that. Um, the, the bottom uh, line are is... Are we allowed to shoot them? In North Canterbury would be up for that, I'd say. Well... Why not? Exactly. Uh, they're, they're open game. The, the thing is, fish and game didn't do their job. By statute, the South Island had to have 20,350 population held at that. They haven't done that. They collect licence fees to do it at fish and game. They haven't done it. They should be being sent a bill by the Minister of Conservation. <laughs> Tidy it up, fix your problem. But, but no, they've said now it's our problem and we'll get on and do it. So 
how farmers and how uh, conservationists and preservationists fix the Canada goose problem will be uh, in the future, but I know there is methods. It won't involve poisoning, to my extent. I mean, my let's get real about these. These birds are like the size of a small sheep. They're like, exactly. <laughs> and with they're, wings. They're seven foot seven with wings. They're, they're huge, and they're an immense problem to cropland and to small airfields. So we're not really just saying these are a small domestic duck. They're a massive animal. OK, now, they Fonterra have announced a lift and payout. What are we going to see happen from this? Are farmers going to start paying down debt, or are we going to start to see suppliers lift their, lift their prices? Uh, look, farmers are paying down debt. That's pretty obvious. The bankers tell us that farmers are paying down debt, and mm. good on them. But the guys that are cashed up and uh, didn't get into a bit of problems in the la a few problems in the last few years will probably be taking some opportunities as well. And I think land values have, have bottomed out and are probably rising a bit. Uh, interest rates are the lowest in living memory. Uh, long may they stay there, although uh, there is a threat of inflation uh, uh, around the corner. But to me, that's only ever will this nation should worry about non-tradable inflation. It shouldn't worry about the tradable inflation at all. But the signs are all looking pretty good. I mean, the stars for a change have lined up for all sectors in agriculture, bar or in primary industry, bar perhaps the viticulture industry. Oh well, we'll make sure we all start having yeah. having a glass of wine with our with our lamb very quickly. Oh well, look, just um, putting my banker hat on there is I would suggest that um, there's a fair bit of caution too. The um, last three years have been pretty telling, and I think people will continue to consolidate there. There's certainly I think the um, underlying I'm back, Don. I think the underlying value in the land is, is um, on a short, short platform from here. Fantastic. On a personal note, agricultural legend Dr. Bill Kane passed away suddenly on Friday. Here at Straight Talk, we'd like to pay tribute to this legendary man. Dr. Kane led the formation of Ag Research and Hort Research out of the Crown Ministries and was Chief Executive of Ag Research for five years. He was honoured with the Bledisloe Medal for Achievement in Agricultural Research and was a Director of the Levin Horticultural Research Centre and a Regional Director of MAF and MAF Tech in Palmerston North. Dr. Kane was also a Director on many boards including Dexel, Woolpro and Postgraduate Research at Lincoln University. He was also a Chairman of Agmart. He had recently stepped down from this position to spend time with his family in Christchurch. Bill was passionate about agriculture and horticultural science in New Zealand and often critical about the lack of funding and investment by the government. A truly great man. Don, what are your thoughts? Well, he obviously is a man with high credentials. I didn't know him that well, but my predecessors spoke really highly of him and uh, the knowledge I've been uh, appraised of this week here will be sorely missed. Mm -hmm. Yes, he will. Yeah, I agree entirely. Conrad, you were speaking about uh, the Centre of Excellence. Oh, look, um, I've only just caught up with the announcements of uh, this month around Massey and Lincoln coming together to combine on an idea of a centre of excellence targeting you know, farm management disciplines. And obviously both faculties have had strong focus on that. All, all I'd, I'd draw a line under that and say I think it's a great idea. And, uh, and I'd say our agriculture base has been built around these disciplines historically, but further investment and collaboration um, to help handle volatility going forward mm. has got to be a great Look, obviously the merger proposal between the two universities didn't work a few years ago. This virtual centre of excellence, time will tell whether it works, but good on them for at least having the second best Genuine option. crack at it. Genuine crack at it, yeah. It's something to me that I think Bill would really have approved of because he was very much all about uh, taking science away from the bureaucrats That's and right. making it about the scientists. So, um, and, and, and genuinely, I think that we need to have more um, applied science and science around the business of farming uh, apropos you know, some of the other more esoteric science. Exactly, science and vocational options can coexist. And absolutely, should. absolutely. And you know, we've had a, people will say we haven't, but if you look at it, uh, science funding has been a bit of a political football and uh, the quantum has been uh, taken from agriculture, put, a, put around now, we've got the PGP funding and things yep. like that. Still a bit up in the air how all that plays out, but at least we're getting some recognition back in the sector. Which is fantastic. Fantastic, quite right. Great. Coming up after the break, we ask Conrad and Don what or who is pushing their buttons these days. Will it be a rant or will it be a rave? Come back and find out more right after this. Welcome back to Straight Talk. Time now for our weekly rant <laughs> or rave. 
Donna, believe that you've got one for us. Well, look, uh, my rant will be around the size of government in this country. Uh, if big government fixed everything, why are we still moaning about health, uh, education and policing? T total crown expenses have doubled this, uh, in the first 10 years of this century. Um, uh, GDP has doubled as well, I admit. But if big government fixed problems, why are we now in a financial crisis? It makes no sense to me. We've wasted in the last 10 years equivalent, uh, well, cumulatively, enough to fix about five Christchurch earthquakes. And that just makes, it's illogical to me. So look, big government doesn't work. Local authority rates, classic, going to be reduced from 56% of total uh, funding for local authorities, according to the the theorist and the ministers at the time, now up to 64%. So local authority rates rising. We've got to get small government in this country before we get out of the financial mile we're in. I mean, it's a constant story for me, I know, but that's where the, um, that's where the genesis of this economy, again, will start from. Smaller government, more thrift by individuals and government, and getting proper uh, economic development going. We're at the moment expecting government to be all things to all people. It is dumb. Great, thank you. Conrad. Well, look, I have to go the other side, probably do the rave then, won't I? Um, look, I, I just think the um, collective collaboration around how uh, the farming community has looked to support the, the effort in Christchurch and the recovery effort there has been outstanding. And it's, it's from the students and also, you know, the Federated Farmers, particularly, you know, the Farming Army. Um, I know people personally that got very involved with that. And, uh, you know, it's a tragedy beyond measure, really, and has, has tested the resolve of everybody. And our business has, you know, we've had to relocate our business. Unfortunately, we were spared any, any tragedy. But, you know, I, I just take my hat off, actually. It does reinforce to me um, the value of collective effort. And as often, it's easy to take shots at, at the broader, you know, bodies that are there to support us. But actually, uh, the Adverse Events Trust, the work that was done in Southland, particularly, and the Christchurch effort, I'd have to say, paid on a platitude, I suppose, and say that team has well, done a good job. I rest my case. Thank you for that. I rest my case, though. Not a government bureaucrat in sight for either of those processes. And it was private and yep. federated farmers working together across the board. And so we can do stuff. You don't need big government around you. Communities get together. Yep. They are resilient. They do have resolve. Um, it's just about letting us get on with the business, uh, not mollycoddling us. If I, if I could pass on, you know, like... Um, the stock and station industry, you know, pretty parochial. There's people that have never been inside the competitor office for a, a long period of ever. And um, they all uh, left their brands behind, all got out in cars, sure. all, have all helped out. And I think, you know, that's the kind of resilience that I think is, puts farming in good stead and that's why it's still such a dominant player. Do you think that that, that resilience, that uh, dropping of brands, will actually continue beyond the life of the earthquake or will we start to get back to like the government back to basically being oh. niggly again? Uh, look, it, things, <laughs> things change very quickly. It will only take uh, some discussion about water use or, or pollution or something and the, the barriers that, that we had broken and we had this good connection mm. going uh, will be muddied. But it's only by a select few that do it. We wish that we could get over that as a country and just, just work on things that are really yeah. important. And speaking of things that are really important, I really want to have, I don't know if it's a rant or a rave, but I really want to see more focus put into what's happening with the dollar spend on research development and extension in our country. I think what we're doing is actually pretty poor. Well, Federated Farmers Manifesto can uh, expose that we, for 2029, we want uh, government to, or science funding to be 3% of our um, GDP, and it's nowhere near it, it's about 1% right now. Fantastic. Now, just before we, we go, I believe uh, that p that orange is the colour to be. <laughs> Don Nicholson was just telling us that he's come back from a trip to, to Paris and orange is in. Orange is in. Bob Parker is way ahead of the game. But I can tell you there's a variety of shades of orange. And I, you know, high-vis jackets are really orange, but there is more pale, muted shades. But orange is in, Mandy. I'm sorry. Your next time you're on here in the new year, you'll have to be... Oh, sorry. My whole new year will have to be orange. Oh, great. I'll have to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, F and G staying green. F and G staying green? Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure how orange is going to go with well, that clean green status. Orange and green work together. Yeah, we, yeah, it's, a, it's a religious connotation <laughs> there. You're more travelled than me lately, Don. Yeah, see, I'm not even going to go there and ask you to wear your wearing your orange there, but obviously you're, you're, you're out in orange and pride. Maybe these high visits no, to right, be. But look, Bob Park is the man. He's done the job. What a great uh, oh, what a front legend. he has been. He has fronted what everything. And um, uh, my hat is off to him uh, because he and his uh, the people around him have yep. really done a fantastic job of, of, of 
Incredible. involving the world in their problems. Absolutely, I think that's actually a really remarkable story. I was actually down in Christchurch last week when I was attending the um, the conference in Methven, and that's a rant actually to the organising committee of the International Farm Management Conference that was to be held in Christchurch. You arranged for that to get shifted to Methven with very, very little fuss or, or bother. You did a fantastic job to the people of Methven you rock. You made that conference amazing for all of us. So thank you very much for doing that for us. That wraps up our latest edition of Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. I'd like to thank my guests, Conrad Bookshire of Farmers Mutual Group and Don Nicholson of Federated Farmers. Thanks to you too for watching. Remember to check out my blog online at country99tv.co.nz. I'd love to hear from you. Catch you next time and in the meantime, keep on talking straight.